want to welcome you tonight to our third lesson here in Grasping God's Word. And uh, we're excited to uh, go about doing lesson number three and lesson number four tonight. Uh, I believe... Can you bring those? Yeah. Okay. Before you leave here this evening, uh, make sure you pick up one of the uh, class schedules. They're over there on the music stand. It basically gives you the dates. Uh, when we have class and what we're studying that week so that you can kind of uh, see how things are laid out. I wasn't sure how much ground we would be able to cover last week and so uh, this week we're going to actually um, uh, cover some of the material that I wanted to cover last week and there was also a chapter there dealing with discourses that I wasn't sure I was going to get to at all. But as it turns out, uh, we're going to tackle paragraphs and discourses tonight. So um, as we're getting prepared to do this and as we're preparing to really get into the nuts and bolts of uh, grasping God's word, uh, we want to be able to get an understanding of, of how to read the scripture and really look at the scripture from the standpoint of what does it actually say. And that may seem like a really, really obvious point. Um, but you can't determine what it means until you've determined what it says. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, sometimes we want to skip these parts, we want to jump over them, and we want to immediately go to the application. When we do that, uh, oftentimes our application is incorrect or it's insufficient. Uh, oftentimes our application is, is given in such a way that it's not incorrect. It fits with the rest of the Bible. We know we're not uh, uh, heretics, okay? Uh, how many times have you heard a, a Bible message uh, where a preacher stood up and preached and really made some great points in, in the application, but you know that the application didn't come from that passage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what you don't want to do. You don't want to be just applying things because you've heard them or you know that they're true. You want to be able to extract the meaning of the passage and thereby extract the true application. This is exactly what Jesus does. He teaches and then he applies. And you see it done when it's God himself who's doing it, and it makes you really take notice. You're looking at it and thinking to yourself, wow, this is masterful, and truly it should be masterful. It's God who's the author, and so he knows the book better than anyone, and he's able to, to lay that all out for us. So what we're doing again tonight is a similar work up that we did last uh, Wednesday night when we talked about analyzing and analyzing and analyzing so that we can understand, first off, what does it say? What does it say? So we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to get started. But before I do that, uh, it, it's time. It's, it, it's, it is time. So, so let's hear it. Uh, I want to know who has purchased the cheapest book. Okay? Uh, we're not going to wait for them to get shipped in any longer. All right? We're not going to wait any longer. Joel, I don't see you with a book. So, so you were allegedly going to pay how much? Uh, I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> this is why. This is why. <laughs> All right. So this is definitely on an honest scale. You know what I'm saying? Because I have a prize that's worth you know going crazy for. So, so uh, again, how many paid less than ten dollars for your book? Four, five, six, seven, or eight. That's really that's really good. Now, you you paid ten dollars and then you paid shipping. How many people paid ten dollars or less, including shipping? I'll take that. It was eight ninety, but my son paid the shipping somehow. <laughs> okay, so somebody else pays it. It's irrelevant. I did. Okay. Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime. Right. Right. Okay. Amazon Prime is good. All right, so, so under $10, keep your hand up if you paid under $10. All right, total cost, anybody under $8? Uh, You're under eight? And how many are under $7? You're under seven. All right, with shipping, it was like 616 Six sixteen. Oh, 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 o
Gary paid two seventy one for her book. Two dollars and seventy one cents. And you paid how much for your book? It was two seventeen. Two seventeen. Wow. I'll tell you what. The shipping was thirty dollars. I had no, no, that's her shipping came to the whole thing cost six dollars and sixteen cents, including shipping, which just goes to say that is a really good deal. I mean that is an amazing, amazing deal. And we have a grand prize for the Do not need to share. It doesn't have to be. Oh, that, that was not a criteria. No. And, in fact, is that a second edition? Yes. See, oh, see, you should get better. you should get bonus points for second edition because that's what I'm teaching for. Right. Take it over, Kit Kat. Right. Those are the best deals, second edition. So, all right, awesome. Six dollars and sixteen cents. Wow. Pays to shop around, doesn't it? My star. Now let me ask you this: Did anybody pay over forty dollars? How many paid over thirty? Just fall. <laughs> there should be a price for that. I'll consider. Well, I, I have to admit, I did get a teacher discount. Fifteen <laughs> percent. No, but it was. Yeah, it just wasn't a great discount. It wasn't anywhere near the belt of six dollars and sixty cents. Okay, great. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll dive right into our material. Father, we want to thank you tonight for bringing us together, allowing us, Lord, to uh, have a central purpose here, Father, and that is uh, to know and understand how best to. Uh, interpret the word of God and interpret it in such a way that we really can extract the meaning that you intended. Uh, Father, this is our true heart's desire. And I pray, Lord, that you just bless uh, the remaining weeks that we have together, uh, that as all the different parts come together, Lord, uh, may it really be an encouragement to each one gathered. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Remember, this is just the first part. This is just our first section. We're just understanding what does the book actually say. And we're assuming that for the most part, most of us tend to blitz on by what it really says. And we make assumptions as to what it says. And oftentimes our application then doesn't fit the meaning. And so that's unfortunate for us if we do that. So the challenge for us tonight is to, to finish out this section so we can move on to some more exciting sections. That's not to say that tonight's me uh, lesson will not be exciting and a lot of fun. How many read the fish illustration? All right, so you read the fish illustration. I have got an exercise for you that's going to take the next uh, five minutes. So take a piece of paper out and uh, get your favorite pen working. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to make as many observations as you possibly can from the picture that I'm going to display up here on the screen. So you're going to make observations. <coughs> Hopefully this will not fall asleep. observations just like the girl started making observations of the fish remember she looked at the fish she wrote a few things down the professor said I want you to write more things down Thank you. when you're done you can put the pen down and relax takes a lot of hard work looking at these things, trying to determine what does it actually say. We're not actually trying to just breeze through the passages of Scripture and assume that we know what it says. I guess you could be done really quickly here with this picture. 
and say there's a female scuba diver surrounded by fish looking at a boy who we presume is not inside that tank. Maybe it's a girl. What do you see in that picture? How many observations can you make? Depends on how well you can see it. Hmm? Depends on how well your eyes work. Right, right. <laughs> when I was at the, uh, the, there was an exercise at the police academy. Right in the middle of a lecture, a man runs in the room with a gun in his hand, looks around, and runs back out. And then they tell you, okay, what, what describe him, you know, be observing, you know, tell us everything you can, how tall he was, et cetera, et cetera. So. <laughs> we do that. Friends, I teach friends at the high school. Okay. And I have a, another teacher coming because he yelled and screamed at me and threw stuff at me. The kids love it. They know it's coming. It's down <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's why I wait a few weeks. And oh, then it takes them off guard. <laughs> now I went to get a call from mom about something going. Actually got on the phone and went, no, I can't do this anymore. No, no. But the principal said, do it. It's a good learning experience. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of it fun. is a good learning experience. Has anyone come to you? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Gotta do that. We have meetings with heart conditions. Why should we do that? 
cast on the other net, and the net was full of fish. They drug the fish to the shore, and they counted the fish, and the fish numbered 153. And there are 53 fish in this picture. My count. <laughs> so could be off. All right. Could could be a fin that lasts, you know, and it belongs to somebody else. But so, but I, the point is this: How many counted stripes on the fish? Okay, a handful of you counted stripes. Yeah. How much detail did you look at when you looked at the uh, scuba diver? Did you count her braids? Yes. Okay. Did you know the color of her hair? Did you know the red trim on her gloves? Yes. Did you know this the multicolored uh, diver watch she had? Yes. Did you see the bottle of fish food that she had inside her belt? It's not a water bottle because they're really hard to drink from underwater. <laughs> but what's up? There's, there are bubbles, if I had dropped the picture down a little bit, you'd have seen the bubbles. But there, in this particular shot, there weren't a lot of bubbles. Some of the other shots had a lot more. Um, but all of those details, you're observing things, you're looking carefully at things. And this is how we want to train our mind to look at the scripture. So that we really do, when we walk away, say, I've absorbed that passage and I know what it says. I'm confident that I at least can say, this is what it says. Now, all of us can do that, can't we? Now, every single one of us can, can do that exercise and uh, truly fulfill uh, that aspect of knowing what it actually says. Not all of us can look at it, and all of us would say the same thing. There's not one of us in this room who can look at every passage and say, oh, I know exactly clearly what that means. There are times when we get into difficult passages and, uh, you know, it bears a lot of study and we struggle with trying to determine what exactly it means. But we can all look at it and say, this is what it says. So take your books and let's uh, pull up the, uh, the chapter here on paragraphs. What's going on with the paragraphs? Yeah, it is. It's an aquarium and uh, it's glass. And there's a little kid looking there at the uh, diver. Yeah, exactly. All right. So how to read paragraphs is the first part of uh, this section. And we're going to seek to, to try to understand a few things about it. Uh, as we go through this, you can skip over there to, to number one. And it's at this point that we're saying uh, general to specific. And here's just a handful of observations uh, that we're going to make with regard to the general to specific observation. Uh, sometimes, as you go to various passages of scripture, you're going to see things that are going to appear to be very general, followed by specifics. And occasionally, you're going to see things even reversed. But the Apostle Paul loves to do that, uh, and uh, he, in our book here, we have the illustration of someone who says a general statement like, I like dessert. Do you like dessert? I like dessert. I'm not particularly fond of cheesecake, but I like dessert. All right? So I could be more specific, and I could say, I, I love ice cream, I love strawberry shortcake, uh, I love uh, apple pies, and, and so forth, and become very specific. What ends up happening here uh, with this is the fact that as we look at it, uh, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5.16, uh, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Living by the Spirit and gratifying desires of the sinful nature are basically general statements. They're broad statements. But then the Apostle Paul gets specific. What does he say when he gets specific? What is, what is he adding there? Okay, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And then he'll, he'll even go further than that, and he'll specifically say, here's the deeds of the flesh, and he'll talk about the sins of the flesh uh, as well. And so he is going to do that on a regular basis. Why is that important? Well, as you're reading it, you're trying to understand a paragraph. You need to be able to, to put it together and see it as it's intended, as a whole. Here's a specific statement following a general statement. 
And I know that they're tied together because that's a literary device that Paul, the apostle, likes to make. So it just helps us to be able to, to understand that. Questions and answers. Let's just skip down to this one. Oftentimes you will see places in the Bible that it will say, uh, here's the question, and it will go on to uh, answer it. Uh, Paul says that in Romans uh, chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? You're familiar with that passage, right? Yeah. And he says, God forbid, or by no means. And uh, the question and answer uh, flows right there as the Apostle Paul uh, is able to, um, to state that. And that's a real easy one to pick up. Now, I want to show you a hard one to pick up. And it's one that would not come so natural to us. Because... Frankly, most of us would never really study to this level, but I want you to see it just because I want you to be aware of how the scriptures are really knitted together. If nothing else, you walk away and you say, I'm, I have a healthier respect for God's word. Notice there the example in Mark chapter 2. We just got through this passage this past Sunday, right? So it's perfect. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who asked that question? The scribes who were present in Capernaum uh, when uh, Jesus has gone into uh, Peter's home, his mother-in-law is sick, he's healed her, and uh, you know, next thing you know, you have uh, some days pass, and we have him back in Capernaum, and what happens? The paralytic is lowered down. And when Jesus sees them, he says, I see their faith. Did you pick up on that on Sunday morning when I was mentioning that? Um, as you went through, he specifically states uh, that, son, your sins are forgiven. But just prior to that, in that same verse, he says he saw their faith. And so that's, again, something we would tend to skip over. And understand this, please. When I say we, I'm talking about myself because I tend to read things quickly. And I used to get C's on many, many papers when I was a child because they would put down careless for the C. Have you got a C on this paper? And she'd grade it out and she'd write careless. And so that stayed with me. And that's why it was so profound when I went through these three lessons because I thought, you know what? You're still careless, Kevin. You read through this stuff way too fast. You need to slow down. You need to look at it. Count the fish, okay? Count the blooming fish. Count the stripes. Do all those things. But here as you come to the scripture, there are some things that are really worth noting because it gives a depth to the scripture. In Mark chapter 2, he notes um, from chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, 6, there are five episodes that revolve around a question and answer. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? That's coming up this Sunday, isn't it? You notice that? Yeah, see? How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Why are they doing what is unlawful on a Sabbath? Those are all questions that are asked of whom? Jesus. Asked of Jesus. And then number five, which is lawful on a Sabbath? To do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Who asked that question? Jesus. Jesus. See how there was a, a difference there? There's question and answer, and we have four questions from the leaders to Jesus, but then the last one is Jesus asking the questions. So the Pharisees are challenging Jesus, challenging the disciples, challenging his teaching, and then he is going to answer all of those questions. The first one, the question is asked, who can forgive sins? And we found out last Sunday that Jesus said uh, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. This is uh, the reality. So he says, I'll tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Number two, what is he with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinners. Number three, the question was, uh, why are John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fasting and, and not your disciples? And Jesus says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? That's profound, isn't it? There's just a lot of things here. And then the, the fourth one, have you never read what David did? The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, answering the question if it's lawful or not to do that good deed on the Sabbath. So the fifth question, a little different. It's asked by Jesus, directed at the Pharisees, 
And uh, the answer to his question, as it says in our notes, is, is obvious. The lawful thing is to do good. And so Jesus is going to then uh, heal this man. So Mark is going to balance the five questions that are early on in the Gospel of Mark. And then there's another five questions that are asked at the end of Mark. So that's pretty fascinating, isn't it? It's almost very, very uh, symmetrical in a lot of ways. The opponents are the same in each episode, and in each episode the opponents ask the first four questions, then Jesus answers the last one. So it's kind of cool how, how it's all framed together, all fits together uh, so amazingly. So that's part of the, the questions and answers. Now when you come to, uh, for instance, you come to dialogue, uh, dialogue is common. As you go and you're reading the scripture, you'll see dialogue that takes place between, for instance, Jesus and the Pharisees. Um, they go back and forth. And when you look at it, it's very obvious, and you look at it, you don't really think too much about it. But we should always note who the audience is on both sides, who's doing the talking, who's doing the listening, and vice versa, and pay attention to that. Because there's usually a very specific point to every dialogue that is going on. So there's a lot of great dialogues. Think of Jesus, the Samaritan uh, woman at the well. Uh, there's Peter and Jesus. Uh, you know, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. They go back and they have this, this dialogue. And um, those, are, those are really worth taking uh, a notation of. Uh, some are easy to spot. Most of them, I would say, are easy to spot. He gives an illustration in the book of one that's hard to spot, and that was Habakkuk. If you've ever read the book of Habakkuk or Habakkuk, uh, you'll find that it consists primarily of a dialogue between whom? God and the prophet. God and the prophet. And it's, it's pretty fascinating how that all works out as well. There's times in the Psalms where there's a dialogue between uh, David and God. Uh, you have dialogue with Job and God. Um, you have dialogue between Job's wonderful friends and, uh, and themselves and him also. So those are typical ways that you'll see things expressed in paragraphs. Then go to the purpose statements. Uh, you always want to identify purpose statements. Um, they're phrases that give you the reason of something happening, the result of some action, the consequence of an action, and they're usually introduced by a result-oriented conjunction, such as that. And uh, in the original language, in the Greek, uh, you'll have a, a, a hina, you'll have that word that in order that, and it's translated in order that. So look for those things because you want to see the result or the consequence. And there's always something there that is important. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's a purpose statement. The next one there, Deuteronomy 6.3. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you. Whenever you see especially those two words, so that, make a notation of it and pay attention to it because it's pointing out a purpose statement that needs to be understood. That's um, kind of akin to that word therefore that I made uh, mention of and it, it mentions in the book. You ask why it's there, okay? Because we know it's there for an important reason. You, you see the word so that, you want to figure out what is this purpose, what is going on, and pay close attention to it. I'm going to skip over tonight to the conditional clauses, number six, and understand that conditional clauses. You know, this has nothing to do with Christians. <laughs> I don't know how, how many of you are good English students, all right? Um, but the, when I went to seminary, the last time I had had uh, a, a real English class uh, was, was one that I didn't do so well in in college. But I never had English in high school. I never had English in high school. I was able to jump through hoops and circumvent it all. And so by the time I got to college, I had no idea. And I somehow managed to pass this English class. Now, I was very selective in the things that I committed myself to. Um, if I didn't think I was going to need it in the ministry, I was very, uh, shall I say, uh, unwise. 
Um, because I really never thought I'd need to know what an adverb or an adjective ever, I mean, I mean, it has nothing to do with fishing or hunting or anything, plus um, no sports that I know of or anything else, and so why would I need to know it? And it has nothing to do with, you know, pastoral work that I could tell. So the interesting thing was when I got to Greek, um, the Greek professor came up to me and started asking me questions, and he soon found out I knew nothing about the English language. I mean, just nothing. And he gave me an English primer, and he helped me kind of work through that English primer before I could delve into the Greek and figure that out. So I had no idea what a conditional clause was. And uh, I mean, I, I knew what a lobster claw was, but I, I didn't know anything else about the claws. And when you stop and you think about it, the, these conditional clauses are really important in the original language uh, because you're going to see them expressed usually with an if in, in front of them. Um, and you have some illustrations there in your book. Identify, it says, the conditional clause and the result or the consequence in each of the following. If we claim to have fellowship with him, Yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to have fellowship with him. Uh, the interesting thing is, in the original language, in the Greek, there are three different conditional clauses. And as you're doing some home study, it's always good to grab a hold of a commentary and try to, to read through a commentary if you're preparing a lesson. Because a lot of times, these things will pop out for you. For instance, um, 1 John 1, 6 is a first class conditional uh, clause. And you say, well, what's that mean? Well, what it means is you're going to translate any first class conditional with the word since instead of the word if. So read that verse right now saying since instead of if. Uh, since we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Does that make more sense? Sure it does. That's the whole problem. Since we're claiming, John says, to have fellowship with Christ, and yet we're sinners and we're walking still in darkness, we're really lying and we're not telling the truth. The truth is, we don't really have fellowship with him. And the first class conditional sentence in the original is going to really point that out. What you want to do as you're reading through the English translations is just be aware of that uh, as a whole and and look at it and say well I wonder you know what it is and if you really want to know you might want to look it up online or something uh, check out a commentary uh, that might be able to tell you but just be aware that these conditional clauses can be translated different ways the next verse therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creature the old is gone the new has come that's 2 Corinthians 5 17 that's a second class con uh, conditional uh, clause, it assumes, um, wait a minute, let me reverse that. It's a third class, and it's saying this is probable. In other words, it assumes this is going to be a future condition. And then there is another class that assumes it's false. And so you have three different classes that you're going to, um, you're going to see in the scriptures. So just so you're aware uh, of those. The biggest thing is when you come across that clause and you see that if, you know, pay it some attention. Pay it some attention. Look at it. Ask yourself, what is he trying to say here? What's the, the weight of that? So those are important things, too, as you look through paragraphs. Also, the actions, roles of people, and the roles of God are also important. Um, as you look through these, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But uh, you can pick it up fairly quickly uh, when you're looking at, you know, here's this particular role uh, that God has uh, played in this passage. Now, when you come to emotional terms, one of the things that's interesting is as you read through the scripture, there's a lot of emotion in the scripture, isn't there? There really is. I mean, it's not like it's some kind of abstract book that's just dry. There's a lot of emotion. And... The reason why there's a lot of emotions is because there's a lot of relationships. And so you have emotions that build off of those relationships. So when you read uh, illustration Galatians 4, verses 12 through 16, the Apostle Paul's writing says, I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. And he's, he's using that word plead. What's another word that we see translated in different versions that's like that? Thank you. 
Okay, beseech. We don't say that very often nowadays, do we? It's not really part of our vernacular. I beseech you. Okay. But you get the impression, even today, even though we don't use it, when I say it, you get the idea that this is something important. You really are pleading with me. You, you really want me to, to, to pay attention to this and maybe do this then. And that's the kind of terminology that you see frequently in scriptures. Um, oftentimes, there's emotional terms uh, that are, are frequent. And when you see that emotional term, the point is this. You want to pay attention to it. You, want, you definitely want to uh, say, whoa, you know, why is, why is this so, so poured out in this way? Jeremiah 3 gives illustration um, where God himself is, is saying he, he would open up and pour out his broken heart on the rebellious people. He says, I myself said, how gladly would I treat you like sons and give you a desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you have been unfaithful to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. That's an emotional statement, isn't it? You can just see the burden on God's heart. He wants so much to bless the people of Israel. And yet, what is he seeing? What he's seeing here is an unfaithful people, and it's burdening him. So again, emotional terms. Pay attention to those as you're as you're reading through scriptures. Tone follows right on the heels of the emotional term. The idea that there is always going to be in, in a dialogue of any nature uh, involving relationships, there's going to be a tone. And sometimes they contrast uh, pretty well. You see it with uh, really any of the authors of scripture, but the Apostle Paul definitely does stand out there's a contrast in tone. And the illustration is Colossians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 3. Colossians says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. How would you describe that tone? Uplifting. 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 Encouraging. Encouraging. Definitely upbeat, right? Mm -hmm. It's definitely upbeat. It's something that's very positive and encouraging. Go to Galatians chapter 3 read that one. <laughs> you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. In other words, what is wrong with you guys? Right? How would you go back to the law? Why would you give up on grace? And, and so you have a totally different tone there with the Apostle Paul. Same author, right? Same author, just a different epistle. Uh, but tone, when we listen to it, we say, whoa, listen to that tone. Listen to the tone of Jesus in Matthew 23. Is he calm, gentle, loving in his tone? You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Whoa, that's not really, you know, the gentle Savior MO, right? I mean, he's direct, he is warning them. Um, but we find out in Hebrews that, uh, you know, every, every son who a father loves, he is getting disciplined at the right times. And Jesus loves the people of Israel. There's no question about that. He wants them to repent of their sins and, and come clean with God and be saved. And uh, it, it's to the point where he's, he's going to elevate the tone because he wants to get their attention so that somehow they would understand finally and foremost that they do not have a right relationship with God, which was enormously significant, enormously significant. Remember, the repentant aspect is so important as you see John's preaching and Jesus' preaching when they're pleading with people uh, to, to respond uh, by really understanding that they, their self-righteousness is not going to take them into the kingdom of heaven. And that was the big barrier. They all felt like they were righteous. You know, we live in a society today where we grow up as kids and we think we're pretty righteous, don't we? Somewhere along the line, when we came to Christ, we realized that we really weren't righteous. Uh, that there was a need for the Savior to die in our place. And when we realized that our self-righteousness was going to take us down a road that leads to hell, we came around pretty quick 
hopefully we came around quickly, and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, that turning away from our self-righteousness is so, so important, isn't it? Well, here's the conclusion. Notice with me uh, the conclusion. We have basically uh, gone over sentences, and now we've gone over paragraphs. And we've looked uh, pretty carefully at these texts. And we're going to move to discourses, which is the bigger picture. I want you to see the quote by Hendricks. According to uh, Hendricks, Howard Hendricks, a great professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, he said, a pen is a mental program. <coughs> And he says this, it's important that you mark these observations or write them down. Develop your own style of making observations that's legible and understandable. For example, you can mark cause with a big C and draw a connecting line to the effect, which you can mark with a big E. Okay, so what he's saying is as you're going through the scriptures, uh, he encourages you to take notes and use your pen. <coughs> Hendricks was a genius when it came to to the theological uh, understanding. He uh, has a marvelous way about him, a master teacher, without a doubt. I think it's important that um, that we spend time in God's Word and that we do take the time to make notes. And nowadays, notes seem like they're old school, don't they? I mean, everybody has, you know, a tablet or something, and, and uh, hopefully you can master that tablet and allow those notes to to still be there for you, to be able to go back through and, and to be able to not have to do all of the work all over again, because that's the key that you want to be able to go through. Do some work and uh, be able to say, okay, I, I've gone to this passage and I've, I've looked at it and uh, I'm looking at it and I'm observing it. Keep in mind, notice that last paragraph there, we're not trying to interpret the text yet. The interpretation phase comes later. This first phase, it's a critical one, it's that observing or seeing. We're only asking the question, what does the text say? Right? And you're already bored with it because you're thinking to yourself, come on now. Um, I, I want to go past this. I want to get to the application part. Are you like that? I am. I'm ready. Uh, you know, we've been talking about looking and studying and looking carefully and different things. Let's broaden it out. Let's take the lens. Let's open it up. We've looked at sentences. We've looked at paragraphs. Let's open it up and let's look at discourses. All right? Turn to chapter 4. When you look at a discourse, you're looking at something bigger. When you're looking at something bigger. You have chapter 5. I'm sorry. That's right. Third edition has 5. Second edition is 4. <coughs> For those of you who got the bargain books, <laughs> we're on page 65. <laughs> All right. We're looking at discourses, and this refers to a unit that is connected. And they're longer than paragraphs. This is something that's, that's bigger. And understand this. There are a lot of different methods to studying God's Word. There's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it. Um, how many, when you uh, read your Bible, uh, you tend to read a chapter at a time? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many read smaller amounts than that? You might read a verse. Okay. How many read larger than one chapter? You might read the entire book if it's short, or you might take four, five, six chapters. How many, how many take a bigger chunk? Okay. There's nothing wrong with any of those. Um, they're all different. And I would encourage you to vary your style. Uh, because uh, let it be fresh, and also let yourself see the things that you're missing. By reading only a verse a day, uh, you could find certain things that maybe you're overlooking. Uh, but by reading a verse a day all the time, you're not going to be able to connect the bigger picture. So oftentimes you're going to miss what the author's intent was, because sometimes it takes page after page after page to develop what the meaning truly is. So there are times when we're looking at that something that is a, a part of something. He says here in your notes, there are other terms we could have used for discourse, like story, uh, pericope, episode, unit of thought, chapter. I remember going to pastor's conference only a few years ago, and, and the word of the conference was pericope. Everybody that spoke used the word pericope. And I'm thinking to myself, pericope? What in the world is a, a pericope? 
And so uh, it's just kind of funny. I, I see that word now, and I just think of that pastor. Do you remember that, Karen? We were at that conference. They, they, those guys kept using that word pericope, and I thought, okay, let's think of another word that nobody else knows. You know what I'm saying? You know, let's pick one up, and uh, then we'll really stand out. But um, as you look at these sections, they, they oftentimes fit together. And sometimes we don't see it right away. We, we really don't. Um, I, I'm reminded of a story. I, I, I have a little bit of time. I can tell Joe. <laughs> this husband and wife, they're not really getting along. So they decided they're going to take a vacation. And uh, the fellow had a plane. He, had a, he was a pilot license. And they went to the airport, and they climbed in this plane. And uh, it was supposed to be a real nice two-day thing. They were going to fly. And they got up at about 2,000 feet. They're flying along, and everything's going OK. And uh, he whips out his favorite cigar. And he starts smoking. <coughs> and he is smoking and smoking and smoking. It's filled up that cab. Mercy. And uh, the woman is sitting there, his wife. And uh, she's, she's got her favorite pet monkey with her. <laughs> and the monkey is just crying because of all the cigar smoke in the monkey's eye. And so finally, uh, time goes on for about 15 more minutes, and she's just about had it. She reaches over, grabs her husband's cigar, opens the window, and chucks the cigar out the window. He is livid. I mean, almost crashes the plane. But before he crashes the plane, you know, he's going to make sure he deals with the subject. He grabs the monkey by the throttle of the neck, opens his window, and chucks the monkey right out. <laughs> Notice he says here a discourse or a pericope can be smaller within a story, David and Goliath, or it could be longer. It could be the David narrative. Fitting this all together is really the most important uh, part. Why should we care about discourses? It's because the bigger picture looms sometimes and includes the real meaning of the passage and so it's important for us to be able to put it all together there's going to be different aspects that you're going to see in the discourse um, we looked at the small sentences and paragraphs where there was re repetition cause and effect we just talked about general to specific we talked about conjunctions all of those things fit into the bigger picture here with the, the discourse but look at the things that we're looking for in discourses we're looking for connections between paragraphs and episodes. Uh, we want to figure out how these paragraphs fit together. And this is why it's a wonderful thing to be able to sit down, for instance, and I've said this, I think, on Sunday morning, to sit down and read the book of Mark from cover to cover. So read from chapter 1 right on through the end. It takes you about 40 minutes to read it. But if you read it like that, you'll have a better understanding because you've got a different perspective. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you just take one chapter and you read it a chapter a day, again, that's a good thing. God will speak to your heart. You're in God's word. That's awesome, right? But if you can take that time and you can read it, you'll get a whole other view of what's happening in the book of Mark. So, again, you have to ask yourself, how does this paragraph relate and connect to the other paragraphs that come before and after the one you're studying. Look for connections. Look for repeated words. Look for repeated themes. Look for logical connections uh, like cause and effect. It's important to be able to do that. It's important to be able to do that. There's a man who was building a house. He decided he was going to build a house, and he wanted to build a house out of bricks. He ordered one million bricks. It's going to be a huge house. And he started building it himself. And he got all the way to the end. And he had one brick left over. You know what he did with that brick? Threw it up in the air. It's a brick of <laughs> which, re which reminds me of that, that husband and wife in that plane. He felt terrible. He felt terrible. And he looked out there and he thought to himself, if I could do anything to bring that monkey back, I would. 
and he wished that that monkey would come back and he looked out there on the wing of the plane and he'll never guess what was hanging on the wing of that plane. <laughs> the monkey. <laughs> and it looked like everything was going to really be back together because you'll never guess. You know, the wife had thrown his good cigar out. It was his favorite Cuban cigar. And he looked out there and there's the monkey. And guess what the monkey has in his hand? <laughs> He's got the brick. <laughs> That's a pericope that fits together with another pericope, you see. You were connecting those dots. And so we see this happen. And it, it's really, um, it's masterful how you see the Lord uh, put all these uh, things together. Let, let's, um, you, you can look on to the uh, passage as it's written out here in this um, uh, example here of Mark chapter 8. Or you can take your Bibles and look up Mark chapter 8. Um, in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, um, we come to a section here. They came to Bethesda, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand led him outside the village, and when he spit on the man's eyes and put hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. And we just got through talking about the paralytic who was healed by Jesus, right? We just talked about that on Sunday. And what did I say about the significance of that miracle? It was a total healing, wasn't it? His legs, no doubt, had atrophied. There wasn't muscle there. And how many weeks of PT did he get after Jesus healed him? None. Right, none. And so Jesus has that power to heal immediately and fully. And now you come to Mark chapter 8, and what are we finding? We're finding here in Mark chapter 8 that there's a, an issue. Jesus is going to heal this man, spits on the man's eyes and puts hands on him, right? And, and is the man able to see? He's, it sounds to me like he's still legally blind. He used to be able to see nothing. And now he can see trees walking around. Last time I checked, trees don't walk around. Okay, So he's got a ways to go yet. And so... Jesus says, or Jesus did one more time, he puts his hands on the man's eyes. And then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus said, you know, don't go to the village, go home. Now, that we would say is a strange passage, correct? And some might say, well, how do you understand that? I mean, why was Jesus' power limited? First of all, was Jesus' power limited? No, it wasn't limited. So there must be something to this. And so, as you look at this, you want to look for the connection. You're going to look for a connection to something that's bigger, so it helps you to understand what that passage says exactly. So, if you were to go to the passage and the context that immediately precedes this context, this context is verses 22 through 26. Look at the context 14 to 21, and you have a situation where the disciples, it says, had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them, watch out for the east of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with each other and said, it is because we have no bread that he's saying this. He's aware of their discussion. Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Now, when you read that, do you not see, what are you thinking about? There's a connection, isn't there? What did we just get talking about? We talked about a blind man who's seen trees walking around, right? And then Jesus heals him the rest of the way, and he can see clearly. Jesus is asking that prior to that episode with the blind man, Jesus asks him, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears that fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke up the five loaves from 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they all said 12. When I broke the seven loaves from the 4,000, how many baskets did you pick up? And they answered seven. He said, but you still not understand. Okay, so we've got some clues as we look at that preceding context, don't we? We're looking at it and saying, okay, uh, that's interesting because they saw partially, but they didn't fully understand. And the blind man, after Jesus put his hands on him the first time on his eyes, he saw, but not fully. Are you with me? And so now we're going to look at the following context. Because again, we're putting this pericope, this discourse together. 
and we're pulling all the pieces together and look at chapter 8 verse 27 and 30 through 30. Jesus and the disciples went up to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. Uh, on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? <coughs> Critical question, isn't it? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. What about you? Who do you say I am? Jesus asked. And Peter answered, you are the Christ. Now, where's the connections? Where are the connections? All three episodes are dialogues. All three episodes, Jesus asks a question. First question, Jesus' dialogue is with the disciples. And he's asking, you know, then, do you still not understand? The next part, when Jesus is going to heal this man, um, he's going to ask him, do you see anything? He looked up, I said, I, I see people, they look like trees. Okay. And then the third part, um, we find him saying, again, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ. So in the first episode, you'll see in your notes there, Jesus' dialogue is with the disciples. In the third, Jesus' dialogue is still with the disciples. In the middle, it's different. He's talking to the blind man, right? And so the blind man and that discussion there, that, that conversation happens between two other conversations. And in the middle episode, um, it mentions the village twice. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Third episode mentions villages too. So Jesus ends the blind man episode, verse 26, by forbidding him to go back into the village. Jesus ends the third episode by forbidding the disciples to tell anyone about it. So the middle episode revolves around terms that relate to seeing. We have the blind man. Uh, Jesus spit on the blind man's eyes. Do you see anything? He looked up. I see people. They look like trees. And you have that common language associated with seeing. In light of the terminology related to seeing, in the blind man episode, it's interesting to note similar terms used in reference to the disciples in the first or the third episode. Do you not still see? Do you have eyes but fail to see? So the repetition of seeing in the first two episodes is a connection, um, as we see all of them pretty much uh, fitting together. The conclusion is, in the first episode, Jesus asks his disciples some questions and realizes they don't really understand who he is. Because why? They only see partially. They only see partially. So understand this. Jesus is trying to teach the disciples about who he is, who, who, who he is and what his identity is. And right in the midst of that, God provides a blind man. Isn't that neat? I mean, it just happens to be there. Remember, you know, who has sinned, this man or his parents? And the answer was neither. 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 He's here because God's going to do something with him to make a point. And the same thing's true with this man here. God's going to use this man to make a point. And so as Jesus uh, lays his hands on this man's eyes and the man sees partially, uh, he's very much like the disciples who are also seeing partially. Then Jesus puts his hands on him again, and the man sees perfectly clear. And the same thing is true with the disciples by the time you get to the third discourse here, or the third connecting piece, and you look at it and you say, okay, now I get it. The disciples are saying, ah, yes, we know, Jesus, who you are. Peter says, I know you are God. I know it. I get it. And the light goes on. Isn't that fabulous? That's fabulous, isn't it? Now, let me ask you a question. If you were going to teach on this, if you were going to teach on the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 8, would you take three weeks to preach on all three of those sections? You certainly could, couldn't you? And it's done frequently. It's done frequently. Uh, this week we've got a message, and, uh, you know, the, the, the message is uh, about the disciples. Uh, forgetting to bring bread. And uh, this is my, 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 Jesus says this, and it's because we forgot the bread. And Jesus says, do you still not see or understand? We could do a whole message just on that one section, right? Very easy to do that, like that. If you were teaching a class 
and you were going verse by verse by verse, you would probably take that passage, wouldn't you? In all likelihood, you would be tempted to take that passage. And you would just teach on that one passage. And the next week, you would teach on Jesus healing a blind man. And uh, you would try to figure out what in the world that means just based on that one passage. And you'd have people asking you questions in your class. Excuse me, why, why didn't Jesus heal him completely? Uh, was Jesus, like, powerless? Did, did Jesus lay aside some of his attributes and that's why he couldn't heal the man? Uh, excuse me, excuse me. And you'd be sitting up there going, ah! I go, you know, what do I do with this class? Now, this is the kind of thing that happens frequently, doesn't it? It does happen frequently. And then the third week, you're there to teach, and you stand up to teach, and you say, well, okay, um, this is the section here um, that we're going to look at, and uh, who do you say uh, that I am is the question Jesus asked. And so this morning, I want to ask you the question, who do you say that Jesus is? What have I just done? I've just gone straight to application, didn't I? And we all love the application. That's the whipped cream that sits on top of the ice cream sundae. And we just love getting there. But the reality is, the upside down part of the ice cream sundae, it needs to be on the bottom. You need to be able to dig through and see what the passage says. Here's, what, here's how the Bible comes alive. The Bible comes alive when you put all three of those sections together. So in a few weeks, when I'm, I'll, I'll be in Mark chapter 8 in a few weeks. And as I'm in Mark chapter 8, you better believe we're going to take all three of those sections. Because if you take them singularly, you will be able to do some things with them, but would you agree that you're going to miss the meaning of the passage? Yes, you're going to miss the meaning of the passage. Do you want to miss the meaning of the passage? No, no we don't want to miss the meaning of the passage. Right. So, so backing this up just a little bit, and our five steps in the interpretive journey, what was step number one? What was step number one? What is the text meaning in their town? And we drew some buildings and we said this is their town. <coughs> and when we talk about their town, what are we talking about? We're talking about the biblical audience, correct? Mm -hmm. That's the biblical audience that we're concerned with. And the first thing we want to try to understand is, what did this mean to them? So we're going to ask ourselves as we go to Mark chapter 8, you know, what is going through their mind? And Mark gives us a lot of insight as to what's ricocheting around inside the disciples' heads. I mean, that's what he does here, uh, there in verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf that they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they thought to themselves, what does that statement mean? It must have something to do with the fact that we only have one loaf. Did it have anything to do with that? No. 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 So you're understanding that. You're looking back and you're trying to figure out what does that mean in their mind. Now, the second... This is number one. The second part of our interpretive journey is what? Okay, we're going to measure the width of the river. And that's going to depend on a lot of different things. Because what's, what is the river? What's the river? Differences that are mainly due to culture, etc., cetera, uh, history, so forth. You know, the, the political climate at the time, all of those different things. And sometimes the river's going to be, as we said before, very easy to cross, and sometimes it's going to be quite wide. And that all depends upon the meaning in their town versus our understanding of that. What's the, what's the third point? that we need to stop and think about. What are we doing? Oh, yeah. We're going we're gonna to build a bridge, right? We're going to build a bridge, and the bridge is going to go across the water. Isn't that great? 
We all like to have a bridge to cross the water. And how do we cross that water? What is this bridge? We call it the principalizing bridge. But what does that mean exactly? Theology. Theology. Okay, so what are we trying to do? What are we looking for when we're building the bridge to go across? Um, similarity. We're looking for principles, but not common principles. We're looking for what kind of principles? Theological principles, exactly. So we're looking for theological principles. And these theological principles, um, would you say, this is the bridge, would you say that the theological principles that are what this bridge is made out of would you say that they're timeless or they're culturally dependent? Okay, they're, they're, they're totally timeless. When you think theological principle, think of something that never changes. If it's going to change based on culture, society, time, then it's not a theological principle. All right? Theological principles never change. Give me a theological principle that's not related to any passage we've looked at. Give me a th any theological principle you can think of. God is good. God is good. There you go. I knew somebody was going to say that. <laughs> so God is good. Right. And uh, that's a theological principle that is true in Genesis chapter 1. And it's true in Revelation chapter 21. It's, it's tr through and through and through. Where do we find theological principles to cross that bridge? Where do we find them? We find it in the Bible. We find them exactly in that passage, right? That's an important aspect. We're, we're looking for them in that passage. So that's um, something you don't want to miss, right? You don't want to miss that. So we find that theological principle in the passage. And if it's not in the passage, should we preach it? No. Or teach it? You're better off just sticking with the passage and extracting from the passage what those principles, those theological principles are. The fourth point that is in the third edition and not in the second edition, although I will say cover myself with my second edition that I love, it is in there, it's just not a separate line item number four, but it is in the third edition and I know most of you have third editions. What's that fourth principle? Consult what? Consult the biblical map. Consulting the biblical map means what? Does it fit the rest of the Bible? We're going to consistently look it over to see if it violates other theological principles of Scripture. So that we are making sure that our theological principles are sound. We don't want to come up with a theological principle that's heretical. Would you agree? Yes. We're going to teach this. We want to make sure. And the last point on the interpretive journey is doing what? It's doing the application. The application. Is the application timeless or does the application change? Sometimes the application is the same. But sometimes the application is very pertinent to the day and age in which we live. In other words, uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't necessarily make an application uh, for something that has to do with uh, a computer or a, a smartphone or something today. You wouldn't have done that 50 years ago, for obvious reasons. All right? And so your application is going to vary as, as time goes on. And so that application. Um, it's going to be up to you as the teacher to make that determination and apply it directly to your students. However, remember this, the theological principle comes from the passage and it is timeless, okay? It's timeless. And you've checked it with the rest of scripture, you know that God is good, and you've checked it out with all the rest of the passages, and you've not found one place in scripture that says God is not good, right? And so you're standing on firm ground now you're going to apply that principle of God is good to your 12th grade class or your 8th grade class. And you're going to apply it and you're going to say, we know God is good because of X. 
Okay, we know he is good because of this. We see his goodness here. We see his goodness there. The people of Israel, they, did they believe God is good? Yes. They believe God is good. Uh, what two main events in the Old Testament did they, did they always praise God for? The people of Israel praised God continually and said he is good because of? Passover. What's that? Passover. Passover. Uh, that's not the one I'm thinking about. Think about Passover. one that's re just repeated over and over again in the Psalms and the prophets. God is the creator of all things. He is the great creator. And then the second thing they praised God for and would point to his goodness about was the deliverance from Egypt. Yeah, coming out of Egypt. Those two things are a repeated pattern throughout the scriptures um, from the Old Testament Jewish perspective and even in the Jewish perspective in Jesus' day. Uh, you see it reiterated over and over again. So we're almost out of time here tonight. Uh, let's just... Uh, but I wanted you to see that connection there in Mark chapter 8. I think that's a powerful example of putting it all together so that you can see the meaning of a passage that has um, a, a true discourse that Jesus begins. And it's going to take some work to find that, isn't it? Or a really good commentary. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So, but the point is this. There, there's nothing wrong with going to a commentary. A lot of people never go to the commentaries. They never really dig around. They never really spend the time to do that. We have some marvelous things. We'll talk about those marvelous things, too, as far as tools and so forth in a subsequent lesson. Uh, but making sure we understand some of these things, it's vital uh, for us to be able to do that. Number two is um, on your list there, and I'll just hit these real just briefly. Um, story shifts, major breaks and pivots. Uh, you're looking for... A real change in the subject matter. Let me just say that um, uh, it's, it's interesting here. You'll see the notation there. Uh, one way to spot this kind of break is by closely observing the change in verbs. Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul uses a large number of explanatory or descriptive types of verbs. There are almost no imperative verbs in chapters 1 through 3. That's not that unusual. In fact, in some of John's writings, you might go quite a ways, and then you'll notice, oh, look at that. That's the first imperative in the book, first John. You look at it and say, oh, okay. Uh, up until then, there were a lot of verbs, but they weren't imperative. What is an imperative verb, by the way? Command. It's a command. It's a command. So you can read it, and you find no commands, and then all of a sudden you get to this one, whoa, okay. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, he covers a lot of doctrine lays out the doctrine. By the time you come to chapter 4, the foundation of the doctrine is laid, and now he's making application. Things like, you know, be kind one to another. Well, why should I be kind one to another? Well, it's because of all the other things I just wrote in chapters 1 through 3 about how God loves us and he's forgiven us and so forth. And so you, you see the, the importance of, of that. Um, notice as well uh, the interchange it's a literary device used in narratives. Um, you, you see it on and on where there's comparisons and contrasts. Uh, First Samuel is a great example of that. You have two families. Eli, he's fat, he's lazy, he's a priest. He's got two uh, uh, really disobedient, wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And then they're contrasted with Hannah and her very godly son, Samuel. And you'd have those two stories, and they just kind of unfold at the same time. Uh, you'll see that over and over again. Pay attention to that as well, um, if you can. Uh, chiasms are, are neat. Uh, you can read through that. A lot of our new translations will pick out uh, chiastic uh, literary devices. You can see uh, how that works. Pick it up with me here with the uh, section on conclusion. Um, we are done with this first section, as of now, which was how to read the book, basic tools. And then next week when we come together, we're going to deal with context. And it's fascinating. The title of our lesson next week is, what do we bring to the text? So we're going to come to the text. Hopefully, we've spent time and effort, hard work, determining what is it saying. We're not ready to say, how do we interpret it yet? Now we're getting into the interpretive part. 
And the first thing we need to do is understand what are we bringing to this text that we're trying to figure out the meaning of. Because all of us bring something to the text. And so we want to first start, though, and you'll see that with the conclusion part, read and observe all the details of the passage that we're looking at. Uh, pick up the, the points that stand out, the different devices, look for the connectedness, and so forth. Remember, we're still only at the first step of grasping God's word. We're going to go on. We're going to find out. We're going to discover the meaning and uh, how to apply it. But these uh, chapters that we've just gone through are really vital for us to understand um, exactly how to analyze the scriptures carefully enough that we can uh, be confident in saying, I think I know what it says. All right? So that's kind of where we are at this point in time. We would say, I think I know what it says. I'm still not sure what it means. Okay? I'm sure that's, I, I don't know what it means, but I know what it says. That's the first part. That really is the first part. And so uh, it's going to take work. It's going to take time. So let's say you're preparing a lesson. How many are preparing lessons for this coming Sunday? Okay, a few of you are. You want to be able to look at that passage, those verses that are part of that lesson, and spend time looking at them very, very carefully and, uh, and trying to determine uh, some of the things that we've been talking about here uh, this evening. If you're in a, a children's curriculum, you're going through something, uh, you're not going to be able to, to take the time to look for the connectedness because they've already channeled it on down, they've already done the interpretation, and probably they've already done the application. And so when you're sitting down there to teach them, that's already been all laid out. Okay, so what you want to do is if you want to be creative, take a fresh look at it. Take a fresh look at it. Use your own application and, um, and apply it. I think students like it when teachers put a little bit of extra into it and, and pull all those things out. So you guys have been great. Any, any questions up to this point? We're going to close with a word prayer in a second, but anybody have questions that I can't answer? Uh, Joel asked, uh, is there always a connection, and how do you, how do you know when to stop looking at, uh, looking for the connection? One of the biggest tasks we have as Bible students is seeking to find the context. Where does the context begin and end? Uh, so that's the big challenge that we find. And whatever passage you're going to teach on, that's where you want to start. You want to start by saying, what's the preceding, what's the following context? Maybe it's right at the end. Maybe, there's, there's, maybe it's tied to nothing afterwards. But you want to just do your best to try to figure out if it fits within something else or if it doesn't. And um, some of that you can pick up on your own by reading through. But you can see the subtleties with Mark. That probably isn't something that you're going to just read through Mark chapter 8 to pick up. And so, um, uh, but now, you, now that you're looking for it, you probably will. Right? Yeah. Don't be afraid. You can always read a commentary. And, <laughs> and here's, the thing. here's the thing. There's a lot of commentaries that don't pick up on this either. A lot of them. There's, We'll, we'll talk about some commentaries and different things uh, as we go through. There's a lot of commentaries, and I, I can talk about it for two hours. So, um, But uh, there's a lot of good stuff that we'll, we will talk about as we get to that lesson. Let's have a word prayer. This is like the fastest hour in 15, 17 minutes of my life. You know, when I come to these things. It's like blink, it's gone. God, we just want to thank you that uh, we can come together tonight. Uh, I know... Uh, these dear folks are busy people. I know that they have a lot of their plates, and uh, they're pulled in a lot of different directions. But, Father, they, they decided that it was important to come here uh, this evening. And I just pray that uh, you would uh, just take the things that we talked about tonight and embed them in their hearts and minds so that they might be uh, more effective at uh, being able to look at God's Word and apply it to their own lives and uh, understand the meaning. And, Lord, uh, for those who are, are called to teach, Lord, uh, and we all... Uh, teach in some capacity or another, even uh, across a, a kitchen table, Lord. Um, give us wisdom. Give us understanding of your word uh, that we might be able to advance your word um, to those who have open hearts and minds. So bless each one, Lord. Uh, give us a great rest of the week. We look forward to worshiping you on the Lord's Day, Father. We thank you for all these things now. In Christ's name, amen. amen.